Where were you on 9-11 when you heard of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center? What time was it? How did you hear about it? What were you doing? Who told you? Who else was there? How did you feel about it? How did the person who told you seem to feel about it? What did you do afterward? What if I told you that you are incorrect in what you remember about those events? You might well disagree with me. I might never be able to convince you that you are wrong about your memories concerning 9-11. But please let me try. I recently watched the first 1996 Tom Cruise Mission Impossible film again. Was it really that long ago? Can you remember the scene where Cruise is hanging on a wire in the computer room, copying the knock list of undercover agents onto a floppy disk? Can you remember whether the floppy disk was blue or yellow? Or do colours fade with time? The last time I showed you that you could not believe your eyes, and why eyewitness testimony is not a safe bet. But regardless of the inefficiencies of our visual system, whatever it does eventually present to us, we should be confident in our ability to recall later, surely. No, our memory, like the rest of our brain, is not intelligently designed. It evolved through natural selection because it did the job in keeping our forebears alive and out procreating their competitors. When we see, hear, touch, feel, or smell something, no entry is made on an index card to be filed away and later recalled in the same state it was originally written down in. Our memories, our brains, are malleable, organic. Connections are continually being made, unmade, and remade. Memories are being recalled, manipulated, and rewritten. We remember different things in different ways. We often use association when remembering things. Thimble, thread, thorn, point, pin, Cleopatra, eye, sewing, sharp, hurt, haystack, syringe, knitting, injection. These words are quite easy to keep in mind for a while because of their associations. But what about numbers? 191, 419, 181. Just nine numbers there, but can you repeat them back to yourselves right now? How did you do? What about these? 1939191452. Can you immediately repeat those nine numbers back to yourselves? You could? Right, what about the first nine? Or have you lost them? What about if I presented these two sets of nine numbers to you like this? 1914, 1918, 1. 1939, 1945, 2. These are the same two sets of numbers but I'm willing to wager that you would be able to repeat them back to me with much more ease, even if I asked you at the very end of this video, which I won't. We do not just remember things. We remember associations and context. As an illustration, remember back to the list of words I gave you. Can you recall what was in the list and what was not? Was thimble in the list? What about haystack? Was banana in the list? What about needle? Thimble? Haystack, banana, needle. Of course, only two of these were in the list. If you think three were, then I have kept my promise to implant a memory into your brain. Our memories are constantly being manipulated and reformed. The human brain is not just a blob of jelly or the heat sink for the heart, as Aristotle taught. In your brain right now, there are 100 billion neurons, each with numerous dendrites and 100 trillion spines on those dendrites. These spines move around, searching for a nearby active axon. If they find one, then a new connection is established, a memory is made. How precisely memories are stored, we do not know, but we are getting ever closer to finding out. How active the dendritic spines are, and how likely it is that new memories will be formed, is partly down to brain chemistry. Adrenaline increases the brain activity, increases the chance that a memory will be formed. We all understand that memories evoke emotions. Evolutionarily, this makes great sense. When you're wandering across the savannah, memories of where you were scared shitless by a saber-toothed was name are very important if you want to avoid future brown trouser moments. Flashbulb memories are so-called because of the high emotional content of the memory. An obvious recent flashbulb memory moment 
was 9-11, which would have emotionally impacted a very wide variety of people. Perhaps the most famous go-to flashbulb memory was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Others have included the death of Princess Diana, the Challenger shuttle disaster, Ronald Reagan being shot, the deaths of Elvis Presley, John Lennon, and I'm certain you can think of more, including very personal flashbulb memories. You'll not be surprised to hear that a lot of research has been done into flashbulb memories, and it has provided evidence that flashbulb memories are no more accurate than any other memories, though the perception of their accuracy is higher because of the emotional context. The morning after the Challenger disaster, in 1986, 106 introductory psychology course students at Emory University in Atlanta were asked, what time was it that you heard about the disaster? How did you hear about it? Where were you? What were you doing? Who told you? Who else was there? How did you feel about it? How did the person who told you seem to feel about it? What did you do afterwards? Two and a half years later, 44 of the students, now seniors at Emory, were contacted again. They were not told why they were being contacted, but were asked to fill in the same questionnaire again, and also to rate how confident they were in their memory of the events. They were also asked if they'd filled out a similar questionnaire on the subject before. Only 11 of the 44 said yes, they had filled out a previous questionnaire. An example of their responses. I was in my religion class and some people walked in and started talking about it. I didn't know any details except that it had exploded and the school teacher's students had all been watching, which I thought was so sad. Then after class I went to my room and watched the TV program talking about it and I got all the details from that. That was 24 hours after the event. When I first heard about the explosion, I was sitting in my freshman dorm room with my roommate, and we were watching TV. It came on a news flash, and we were both totally shocked. I was really upset, and I went upstairs to talk to a friend of mine, and then I called my parents. That's the same person, two and a half years later. Neiser and Harsh, who carried out this study, repeated it when the San Francisco earthquake hit in 1989. They did find that memories were more accurate or consistent three years after the event among those directly affected by the earthquake. University of California students in Berkeley were questioned, but students at Emory, not directly affected by the quake, were very prone to distorted memories after three years. Later studies have suggested that much of the memory mangling takes place in the period immediately after the event, such that if you compare two people's recollections years after an event, comparing one with their recollections from immediately after the event and the others with their recollections some days after the event, you will find that the person initially questioned some days after the event will have changed their story less. It would appear that our memories are manipulated as we soak up fresh details about an event. Stepping away from flashbulb memories and into implanted memories. Remember 1996 and Mission Impossible. Was the floppy blue or yellow? What's your gut reaction? Well, for the computer nerds out there, 1996 and Mission Impossible was when Verbatim launched their 3.5 inch optical disc onto the market with a massive 230 megabyte capacity. So it wasn't blue, yellow or floppy. But posing the question in the way that I did might just have altered your memory for a moment. A year before Mission Impossible, in 1995, a study was carried out on kindergarten kids. Once a week, for four weeks, the kids would be told 12 stories about a clumsy man called Sam Stone. Then, one day, during story time, Sam Stone visited the class. He was introduced to the pupils, walked the perimeter of the classroom, and then left. In the weeks following the visit, the pupils were questioned about it in various ways, some with simple questions, and some with leading questions, implying that Sam Stone had ripped a book or soiled, whatever that is, a teddy bear. Then, ten weeks after the visit, the children were interviewed again and asked simply to tell everything they could recall about the visit of Sam Stone. Only if the children did not mention the book or teddy bear were they gently prompted. Forty-six percent of the children reported that Sam Stone had damaged a book and or soiled a teddy bear with no prompting whatsoever. When prompted, the figure rose to 72%. There are more of these studies for you to read up on. 
In the 1980s and 1990s, scare stories started to emerge and people were imprisoned on charges of ritualistic child abuse linked to satanic cults, which themselves were supposed to include human sacrifices. The press loved the headlines, the moral panic spread, and a full-scale witch hunt was launched. Where did the stories come from? Many of them were the result of suggestible individuals having memories implanted in them during hypnosis and other therapeutic sessions. The therapists might have been guilty of nothing more than ignorance of the malleability of human memory, but the lasting damage done to many people and their relationships with their loved ones was severe. The accuracy of your memory is not measured in how vivid it is or how certain you are that it is correct. Next time, a bit more about adrenaline and memory and how what we, well not me, but neuroscientists know is helping victims of PTSD, including rape victims, to forget their ordeals. Thank you, as always, for watching.